Greetings and salutations, Internet! It's Sunday. So this is going out very late. I know. I know I promised to vlog every second Friday. Um, but on Friday, I didn't upload a vlog for three reasons. One, I was a little busy scaring the web for a job, <laughs> a second job, a weekend job, so I can save up enough money to go see my sister married in Australia next year. So far it's been very unsuccessful. Uh, the second reason is partly because uh, the job hunt has been so unsuccessful. I was un I was not in a good place Friday. Um, I wasn't unwell, I was just stressed and angry and miserable. And I don't think that would have made for a very entertaining vlog, so... Don't suppose you want to give a stranger $3,000 so she can go home to Australia, do you? No? Well... It was worth a shot. And the third reason was I was trying to give as much time as possible to um, people I'd ask questions of for them to get back to me. Um, and it was actually for the purpose of this vlog. Uh, which is actually not going to be really me. This is just a very long-winded introduction to what is actually going to happen today. I really need to start scripting this. Um, anyway, point is, uh, I thought that I would give you a taste of some of the stuff that I do, um, in my free time for fun. And it will not be a surprise to anyone who knows me that part of what I do in my free time for fun is go to readings. And this year, um, Cheese Series has started up in Ottawa. And what Cheese Series is, is a, a quarterly, I guess, uh, get-together of all the geeks in Ottawa, where we sit down and we listen to stories read by three, usually, authors. Uh, they're speculative fiction, so horror, sci-fi, fantasy, that kind of stuff. Uh, there have been two so far in Ottawa, and they have been so much fun. Last Tuesday was the second, and the authors that read uh, for that were Eric Choi, um, Hayden Trenholm, and Tanya Huff. Um, and so I thought, because you didn't come out to see it, many of you, that you might want a story or two. So I've decided, with Mr. Trenholm's permission, to upload his reading for today's vlog. So, yeah. Here it is. I'm going to read you the first chapter of Steel Whispers, which is Liz's favorite of my novels. <laughs> I deal in death every day. That's my job. I learned not to let it get, touch me. You can't function as a cop if you do. Even 20 years behind a desk, where you're twice removed from death itself, you can't change that. The call came, as these calls always do, at 3 a.m. 3.14 a.m. to be exact. Wednesday, March 16th, 2044. I answered the phone on the second ring. Superintendent Steele? The voice on the other end of the line sounded young. These days, they all sounded young. You got him, I said. I hope it didn't wake you, said the cop. Nah, I had to get up and answer the phone anyway. <laughs> An old joke, but still got a laugh. Truth was, I'd been up for over an hour. Checked the caller ID. What can I do for you, Constable Phelan? Have you left orders to be called if we have another board murder? Same MO as the last four. Where are you? Phelan gave me an address in the industrial southeast. I'm on my way. Superintendents aren't supposed to get involved in crime scene investigations. We're supposed to sit in our offices and read reports and send younger, brighter minds to do the dirty work. But as other senior officers around the Calgary Police Force will tell you, Frank Steele is a special case. A head case, according to most. I sat back in my chair and drank the last of my hot milk. Thankful, I resisted the call of my old friend Jack Daniels from where he resided in the cupboard above the kitchen sink. I've been reading Illegal Alien by Robert J. Sawyer, and I slipped a bookmark into place and put it back on the shelf. I don't read a lot of science fiction. Mysteries are more my forte. 
But this one was a great courtroom drama. Maybe I was hoping his exploration of alien motivation would help me figure out what was happening with the board. These days, I needed all the inspiration I could get. I'd asked Phelan to call for a cruiser, and by the time I'd gotten on a tie and suit, suit jacket and, and rounded up my badge and gun, they were buzzing for me from downstairs. This time of night, traffic on the Deerfoot freeway was almost manageable, and we made it from my northwest apartment to the crime scene in under 20 minutes. I had a pretty good idea of what to expect. The board, as they were known in the popular press, had been a growing subculture in most of the Western world for the last 10 years. Even ever since the cost of mechanical and cybernetic upgrades had fallen from astronomical to merely exorbitant. <coughs> what they call themselves, I couldn't tell you. You need a high-end vocoder to make the sound. Some of the Borg don't look much different than regular humans, with all the modifications and augmentation hidden under their skin. Most like to flaunt their changes, artificial eyes and ears, new limbs ending in claws or tentacles or both, metal skull caps, clean chrome. People overestimate the number of Borg, in part because people tend to do that with minorities, but, but also because Borg culture had spread, it's, it's behind a whole crowd of wannabes, Kids with non-functional copies of board modifications pasted on their skin or fitted over their real arms or legs. But the four dead bodies that had turned up in Calgary dumpsters over the last few weeks had been the real thing. Though what they were after all their modifications had been carved out of their flesh was difficult to say. We've been able to identify three of the victims through DNA records in the National Identity Bank, but the fourth was still listed as a Jane Doe and seem likely to remain so unless we caught the perps. Based on the microscopic residue found in the wounds, she'd had her face largely rebuilt out of metal and ceramic, and both arms replaced, probably turned into multi-use tools. So what was left after her killers were done was pretty difficult to ID. The dumpster where the fifth victim was housed was under a spotlight, and I had the cruiser pull right up to the scene. The ambulance was waiting to make its delivery to the crime lab, but the body was still in situ. Detective Lily Chin was talking to our new forensic guru, Dr. Vanessa Fan. I walked past them before they noticed me and climbed up on the step stool that had been placed beside the metal bin. This war had barely started the modification process, so his body was mostly intact. His right hand had been severed and the vocoder been cut out of his throat. An artificial ear had been torn away, along with the top of his skull, but the face was intact, staring up at me with wide open eyes. All expression had reached out in the hours since death, but I had no problem recognizing him. I deal in death every day, but it's different when it's your own son. I was still standing there, feeling stupid, like I was half asleep, trying to wake up from a bad dream, when Lily Chin came up to me and put her hand on my arm. Sorry, Frank, I didn't see you until it was too late. The identification came in after Phelan told you. I would have warned you, but, but myself was turned off. I said, surprised at how calm my voice was. My cell was sitting on the bedside table, I thought, as if that somehow mattered, as if Anything mattered right now other than the fact I was standing in front of a dumpster looking into the face of my dead son and wondering how the hell he could afford modifications and when did he get them anyway. Josh and I had never been close and the distance between us had grown into a gulf since his mother and I divorced seven years ago. He'd been 17 then, just starting the fine arts degree at the Southern Alberta, at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology and now he was lying in a dumpster like a stranger. I reached out to touch his face. Frank, Jin's voice came from far away. Superintendent Steele! The hard edge in her voice brought me back to the here and now. Forensics hasn't cleared the scene yet, sir. You can't touch the body. It's, it's not a body. It's my goddamn son. But I, pulled, but I jerked my hand back. I'm sorry, really. I'm sorry. Getting old, I guess. I took a couple of steps away from the dumpster and fumbled for a cigarette, 
Forgetting for a moment that I quit on the day and my divorce from Dorothy, Josh's mother, had become final. Maybe you should head home, Frank. I can wrap up here, Chin said, her voice surprisingly gentle. I didn't think she had that in her, but I guess she never stopped learning about people. I looked over at the dumpster. Yeah, right. No, I said. I'll head downtown and get an early start on the day. I should call the victim's mother. It's the first thing they teach you in detective school. Don't let it get personal. Keep your distance from death or it will swallow you whole. I wonder what chapter of the manual told you how to tell your ex-wife her baby boy was dead. I sat at my desk, staring at the phone, trying to remember the last time I'd seen Josh. Was it two years ago or three? I thought of calling Amber, the daughter I'd had during my brief, tumultuous first marriage. But I hadn't seen her since her mother's funeral five years ago. I didn't expect she'd want to hear from me now. At 5.30, I dialed Dorothy's number. It was now or later in Chicago, where she'd been living for the last year. She'd always been an early riser. I didn't suppose the habits of 20 years had changed, simply because she no longer had to escape my morning breath. I debated about whether to turn the video pickup on, but figured Dorothy deserved that much at least. The news would be hard enough without getting it from a blank screen. I could have had the local cops go by her house. That's what the book probably suggested in those cases. She answered on the third ring, a little out of breath and slightly flushed. I'd interrupted her morning aerobics routine. Her endorphins would be elevated, which might help with the trauma of the next few minutes. Dorothy hadn't changed much over the years, still tall, willowy, and blonde, with a kind of face designed to carry the years well, even without the benefits of modern medical science. She looked a lot more than five years younger than me. I didn't say anything, not even hello. I sat there staring at her, past her, the usual clutter of the trendy apartment. In the background, a wall screen was showing coverage of the American Mars mission launch from the Endeavour space platform. We had been moved ahead two weeks to keep pace with the Chinese and European programs. I stared stupidly at the video image of the video and said nothing. Frank, to what do I owe? She stopped him. Dot, I've got that. Oh, Jesus, it's Joshua. I guess I need to go back to basic training. We learn that sympathetic but neutral cop expression we're supposed to use when we break the news. Is he all right? She finished the question, though she already knew the answer. He's dead. She took it better than I thought she would. No hysterics, no screaming. Her face sort of collapsed into its years. She turned away for a moment and rubbed a tissue across her eyes. I heard a couple of soft songs, but when she turned back, she was calm. How did it happen? Some sort of accident? I didn't answer. Somehow couldn't make my throat form the words and let them go. Not suicide. Dorothy's grandfather had killed himself. It almost destroyed her family and she lived in terror. It might be genetic. She talked to a lot of doctors and even made Josh take screening, but she never really believed their reassurances. Maybe that made it easier to tell her. Maybe I thought murder would be a relief. Josh was killed. Someone murdered our son. Her face hardened then, and her eyes turned cold. Joshua stopped being your son a long time ago. I wondered when exactly that had happened. A long time ago, I guess, just like Dorothy said. I remembered him when he was little, how much I loved to hold him and play with him, watch him discover all the things the world had to offer. Then, I accidentally shot my partner during a botched operation, blew half his head off. After that, I spent eight years up my own asshole, going from work to counseling to bars. I finally kicked the counseling habit, but by then Jack Daniels was my best friend, and my little boy had grown into an angry teenager, and a few years after that, we decided to call the whole thing off. And now, when I'd finally gotten well enough, to want to have a family again. It was way too late for any of us. It was time for me to do what I do best, and be a cop.
I have a few questions. It may help with our investigation. I'm sorry I said that, Frank. Yeah, she probably was. But words are like bullets. Once fired, they can't be put back in the gun. Do you have someone you can call, someone who can come over after we're done talking, find the book? I guess, sure, I can. She was starting to look a little confused. Put me on hold and make that call. She stared at me, maybe wondering who the hell I was. Then the screen went blank. A minute later, she came back under control again. She'd been a cop's wife for 20 years. She knew a little about this stuff, too. <coughs> Did Josh, Joshua have any enemies, I asked? No. Everybody loved Joshua. Obviously, not everyone did, but I let it go. When did you see him last? Must be six months, no seven. He came down here for a long weekend, but I talked to him about two weeks ago. He had started a new job, something to do with, oh, I forget. I have his work number. I'll flash it to you. She tapped a couple numbers on the console, and my phone pinged to indicate the number it was now logged in memory. How did he seem? Happy, excited, optimistic, the way he always was. Wasn't how I remembered him, but I took a word for it. How long had Joshua been aboard? My son wasn't aboard. I blinked. Had Chin been wrong about the nature of the crime fooled by the mutilation and the body in the dumpster? Was it a copycat or just a simple homicide that looked like one of ours? I felt a rush of relief. I could shift the case over to the newly minted superintendent of homicide, Willow O'Reilly, and get it, get it off the books of the special detection unit. I mean, Dorothy continued, he was like all kids, enamored with what was new and different. He hung with that dress-up crowd at college. A wannabe, maybe, I thought. So he hadn't had any surgery. Well, yes, he had one of those voice things done. An augment or an actual vocoder, I asked. In the second, I think. And he was talking a couple of months ago about having something done to his hand. I'm not sure if he did it. I, I didn't pay much attention. I thought it was a fad. But, like when he spent all his money on those old comic books, or wanted to try out for the space program because everyone else in his class wanted to. Remember? I didn't, but I nodded anyway. That doesn't make him a bore, does it? The door chimed behind her, and Dorothy waved it open. I was oddly gratified when a woman came through it. We'd been divorced for seven years, and we both moved on, but you never actually want to see your replacement. I'll have a detective call you if you have any more questions, I said. If you need anything, well, you have my number. She nodded absently and turned toward her friend, cutting the connection as she did. I leaned back in my chair and stared up at the water-stained patterns on the ceiling of my office. My ex might be in denial, but I had no doubt that sometime in the last year, my son had found enough cash to begin his transformation into something new and different. And that had made someone think he was a prime candidate for murder. There you go! I hope you enjoyed it! So yeah, if you live in Ottawa, I highly, highly, highly recommend these events. You should really come out and see it. Uh, they have a Facebook page where they post all of this stuff, link to it down below. Um, they're also on Twitter. Twitter? What the? They're also on Twitter, link to that down below. Um, yeah. Uh, links to all the authors as well who read will be down below. Uh, that's all I've got.